Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 18. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Barons, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. In this episode, we interview Anna Barons, author, publisher, speech pathologist, producer, editor, and widow of the late Richard Barons, the creator of this podcast. Anna's company is Nine Muses Books, and her most recent publication is the Monadnock Sherlockian Anthology, comprised of essays, poetry, plays, and fiction about Sherlock Holmes, another interest she shared with Richard. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts, produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Barons. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, from the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. Please subscribe to us on YouTube so we can meet that magic number they have set for us so we can be able to remove advertisements, which we see no revenue from. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents an interview with Anna Behrens. We're here with Anna Behrens. Anna is a speech language pathologist and leader of the Monadnock Sherlockians, Sherlock Holmes Group in Keene, New Hampshire. She publishes her late husband, Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mysteries under her imprint, Nine Muses Books at lizziebordengirldetective.com. And she is the producer of this Lizzie Borden podcast. She is the writer of the Monadnock Sherlockian Facebook blog and has had her essays on Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes published in several journals, some forthcoming. She most recently published the Monadnock Sherlockian Anthology, which is a collection of essays, poetry, plays, and fiction written by members of her Sherlock Holmes group, as well as other fellow New England Sherlockians. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Happy to be here. We're talking about a subject today that's near and dear to your heart. So this is as close as we can get to the creator of the Lizzie Borden podcast, Richard Behrens, by talking to you. His partner in life, his friend, his literary editor, his producer, and sadly, his widow. It's time to have a conversation about Richard, about the eclectic nature of him. And as the author of this series of remarkably interesting and fun books, Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mysteries, but he was also a filmmaker and a dabbler in the esoteric. So his interests were wide and far reaching. To me, Richard was a wonder. He devoured information and synthesized it into his universe, making connections that I don't think anybody else could see. And there was this genius about him. Yet he was really funny and inventive and creating, for an example, this entire language for the sporting boys in the Melancholy Scion, which is part of the Girl Detective series, just blows my mind. Myself, I've known Richard for close to 16 years and have been involved in several of his projects. I found him a true gentleman, and I know that his death in 2017 devastated a heck of a lot of people. But we're quite lucky to have you here, Anna, to talk about Richard, his legacy, and his works. And I have lots of questions. Are you ready? (laughs) I I hope so. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always interested in process. As someone who is an editor, I read a lot of writing, and I edit a lot of writing, and I don't necessarily do a lot of writing, although I do write. So I'm fascinated by how writers begin that process or what they do? Do they write themselves? In other words, some authors say their books write themselves. Some authors outline their works. Some authors know at the beginning what the end is going to be. Some of them write 
as and and make it up as they go along as if the book is writing itself. So in order to do that, you sort of have to understand Richard's mind. So did he have like a focused or a scattered mind? Meaning, did he just do one thing at a time or did he do many different things around the same time frame? Oh, I would say he's very, he was very focused. He did many things around the same time. So he was <laughs> focused and scattered that way. Okay, all right. Well, I think you have to be focused to be able to do that. Otherwise you wouldn't get anywhere. So for example, like he would, um, like on his nightstand, he'd have no less than like 10 books and he might read a chapter from each every night before he would I could never do that, ever, ever, so, ever. Yeah, so he was always had many books going at the same time, both fiction and nonfiction, just on a variety of things. The same with his writing. He might spend a few hours writing a, a piece of, like an essay, a piece of nonfiction, and then he might move to his fiction and do that. But I did notice with the fiction, he did have like a creative process. Generally, he wanted to be alone. <laughs> and he would like, for example, you know, he he really needed to get like in the creative mode when he was writing fiction. So he liked to be alone when he would do that. I mean, he did have his own private office, but I think he really liked to be completely alone. He would do whatever he needed to do to get like in that frame of mind. Often it was listening to music really loud. <laughs> it was maybe watching some silent film comedy and just laughing, you know, get, I don't know, whatever he needed to do to get his brain in that creative mode. So he did have a somewhat of a process like that. I think that he was very focused, but he needed for the fiction, he definitely needed to go through that sort of process to get his mind in the, in the right place. Would you hear him like reading it really out loud with emotion, all the different characters? Like, would he read his work back to himself out loud? He would um, when when he was writing fiction. When I was home and he'd be up in his office writing, I could sometimes hear him laughing hysterically because <laughs> he was laughing at his own writing, his characters. But he was he would do the different voices. He was quite an actor, Richard. As a matter of fact, when we moved to New England, he started to do some acting in, in local productions. And he was very good. So I bet he was. Um, so he was good at doing voices. Um, you know, he was very physical in his acting. So um, I think that he used that. And so he needed to hear it as well as write it. So when he was creating that language for the the Sporting Boys, which is one of his best stories, the uh, the melancholy scion. Did you hear him like speak it out loud to make sure it sounded, or did he show it to you after he wrote it and read it out loud to you? Or <laughs> yeah, he definitely showed it to me. He didn't. Um, I think he he read some of it because I was like, <laughs> where where did this come from? But I know that he said in part he had watched the Gangs of New York film uh -huh. and he modeled their clothing after the gangs of New York, the old oh, top hat them? and yeah. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Not certainly their language, but I think the idea that they had their own words for things. And he yeah. really took that and ran with it. Yeah, I can imagine him even being like a Peaky Blinders writer. You know what I mean? Something yes. so unique and unexpected is always going around the corner in every one of his stories twists and turns. And yet, didn't he sometimes paint himself into like logical corners or illogical <laughs> corners with some of his mysteries? Well, Richard was a, a night owl and, you know, so he'd be up hours past my bedtime. So in the morning, I'd see him for breakfast and he'd say, oh, I've painted myself into a corner with this mystery. And we we would talk it out. And, and hopefully sometimes I gave him some ideas of how to get out of that because I think with his mysteries, he said, I never started out to be a mystery writer. How did this happen? You know, <laughs> but <laughs> he would get a germ of an idea. And sometimes it was the solution to the mystery, but more often it was the beginning of the mystery. Oh, so, so he worked in both directions. He worked, he worked in both directions. Oh, so okay. he didn't always have the solution. When well, he of course he did. Of course he did. He worked <laughs> in both directions, probably at the same time. Probably at the same time. Do you know how yeah. he came up with the idea for this character, Lizzie Borden, that like 
16 years old being a consulting detective for the Fall River Police Department or for hire. I mean, it's such an unusual, amazing thing to take someone who was accused of murder when they're a a grown woman at 32 and then make her this charming, intelligent person who can solve crime. (laughs) Well, I know that he was involved, like he was interested in true crime. Yeah. And he got involved with the Lizzie Borden community. And I think that's how how he uh, first met you and and visited Fall River. He became for a time the webmaster of the B&B. So he went there quite frequently. He he knew all about Lizzie Borden's life. Right. And and then he Richard read all kinds of things and for some reason he picked up some some old copies of the Nancy Drew mysteries at some used bookshop. And he, and he read a few of those and he said, you know, I'd like to write a parody of the, he thought, well, who can I make, you know, the, the main character. And then he thought, I'm going to use Lizzie Borden and her life and make her the detective. And that's how he came up with it. And it just, he kind of ran with it from there because he really wanted it to be, as authentic as it could be. So he used, you know, real characters in her life well, and real aspects thing. of They're her life. And incredibly yeah. historically accurate to the dates yes. and times and places and the, you know, the writing implements that people used and the inventions that Homer Thessinger invents and the kind of science that progress that had been made at that point. I mean, everything is very historically perfect. Did you oh yes. Uh, I mean, or did you assist him in any of that? Well, yes. Um, we were big on taking road trips and uh-huh. we would visit places and he would get ideas, or else he had the idea to begin with, which is why we decided to go to certain places. Like we went to New Jersey to Thomas Edison's the museum they have there, and and they have a lot of his inventions. And I think that's kind of where he got the idea for Homer Messenger and he saw a lot of these early inventions. Boy inventor, Homer. Yes, kind of thing. And kind of making him really quirky like Edison himself was. And also just going to places like, we went to Marion, Massachusetts, where he learned about the Mary Celeste. We went to the Historical Society there. He bought a few books. He asked a lot of questions. Then he decided to write a Lizzie Borden story based on the mystery of the Mary Celeste, the Pentasmal Brigantine. He would get ideas from travel from places we traveled, or sometimes he would have the idea and we would go there so he can see for himself. He took photographs, sometimes he even brought his film camera and took film. And um, he was really observant. He would, you know, remember places and what they look like and you know. Like so, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like Sherlock Holmes, right. And I think in terms of his Lizzie character, I mean, Richard, um, he was interested in so many different things, but one of his interests was Sherlock Holmes. So I think that's where he got the idea of the consulting detective. I know. see. I see. So it was like, again, the cart before the horse, you know, who, who knows? Nancy Drew, Sherlock Holmes, it sort of all comes together that way. For right. Him. right. Yeah. And he went to England and went to Baker Street and with you. Mm-hmm. So you, and what is the the story you once told me about the automatons? Is that what they're called? Oh, automatons. Automatons, yes. Or automata, I guess is the official. Is <laughs> plural. That plural? But yeah. yeah, there is a um, museum in New Jersey. I've forgotten the name of it, but I think it's in Morristown, New Jersey, where someone had collected all of all of these little machines that make music or do things and donated them to the museum. And there was hundreds of them. So we got to see that. And they even demonstrated a lot how they work. And some were looked like in the shape of little animals, like maybe playing musical instruments or things like that. And that he used that in um, one of his stories as well. Is that the, the minuscule monk? No, no, this was uh, the audible amnesiac. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's right. Where That's right. Yes. these titles are so good. These titles <laughs> I are know. so unique. <laughs> so uh yes. So definitely he wrote about things that you know we did in life or he experienced in life, saw for himself firsthand. That's amazing. Yet in every single story, 
even his little Christmas story that he did, the mm-hmm. Scrooge of Second Street, which we have as a podcast. Um, That's right. Here, yeah. there was this always sort of ever present foreshadowing of Lizzie's infamous future, kind of like seeds planted, sort of, sort of <laughs> like, like we know how she ends up as a person, and yet this fictional Lizzie doesn't know. So there's these little clues as to what her future is going to be like. I think that that's part of the charm of the stories. Oh, I think so too. I mean, Richard, I think himself went back and forth, whether he thought, well, did she really commit these crimes or not? I was going to ask you what he thought, but go ahead. Um, Yeah, I think, I think he, it varied, you know, sometimes he thought it and sometimes he wasn't sure, but um, in the stories, he does, I think, with humor, you know, allude to the mm-hmm. fact that that was the future because he would have Andrew saying, you know, he'd be exasperated with something Lizzie did. And he'd say, daughter, you're going to be the death of me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I think in, in throughout the stories, he creates a very loving and respectful relationship between Lizzie and her father. I noticed that. Um, I noticed that. Yeah. I think especially in The Minuscule Monk, that's the only novel length um, story that he completed. And I think in there, it's especially heartwarming, their relationship. Well, the entire clan, the entire boarding clan, each person has a unique personality. I mean, there's Abby and there's Emma and there's Andrew and there's Lizzie. There's also Bridget Sullivan in his first story, I think was Forlorn Maggie, wasn't it? And and Maggie, if anybody doesn't know, her name is Bridget Sullivan, but back in the day in Fall River, especially people referred to their Irish servants as Maggie's. So that's why Lizzie and Emma called her Maggie and not by her name. They even asked Bridget at trial if it bothered her, if she was insulted by it. And she said no, because it was very common. Whereas Abby called Hmm. her Bridget and Andrew called her Bridget, you know, by her given name. So the forlorn Maggie, and I know Richard knew that. So he writes this story and it's not necessarily about Bridget, but it's about an Irish servant, right? Right. It's it's about someone that Lizzie first sees in a dress shop and she's she's addressed as a servant. And I think the forlorn Maggie refers to her. Right. Um, right. Because from Lizzie's perspective, she would she would call her Maggie because right. she's a servant. Because she's an Irish. Right. Servant. right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the most sort of compelling foreshadowing is in the last unfinished story, which we'll talk about towards the end of this discussion. But the last unfinished story is the phantasmal brigantine about the Mary Celeste. And he has Lizzie having some sort of unknowable, uncontrollable episodes. And they're unexplained. And she doesn't know what's going on. And no one knows what's going on. But she has several of them in the story. And I feel like he's setting up this possible future situation where it might be during one of those episodes that she might have committed crime later herself. But it's it's unexplained. There is a violence to her at that point, but there's no solution or diagnosis of what this situation is that she finds herself in. And she doesn't really remember what she does during that period of time, which is also interesting. I think he's being so brilliant in laying down possible scenarios for the truth of later in his fiction that you can't deny is possible. You can't deny is interesting because Fact may be stranger than fiction, but in Richard's case, it's certainly more fanciful, but it's not unlikely. Right. Okay. Right. I think I think that that was certainly one of the reasons he put that in there. Another reason is I think it worked really well to to be the the way that Lizzie meets 
the young doctor, Arthur Conan Doyle, who has come to Fall River right. um, because she first meets him because she's the patient and he's he's the doctor, at least he's assisting Dr. Bowen. So I thought it was a very clever opening of the story where that's how they meet. Yeah, because yeah. In, in this story, he has Arthur Conan Doyle coming to uh, America to because he's so interested in the, in the Mary Celeste mystery. And he wants to go to where, you know, the captain lived in nearby Marion from Fall River. I think that episode, Lizzie's episode at the beginning kind of serves both purposes. Yes, Um, yes. Yeah. And it even has uh, a purpose within the story itself. I mean, it has a story purpose. It has a future possible truth purpose. And, And it's funny because he must have read Parallel Lives before he wrote that or at least parts of Parallel Lives, that big heavy book by the Fall River Historical oh, sure. Society. Mm-hmm. Because there's that diarist friend of hers named Lulu who wrote about Lizzie having these episodes of being blue. And I'm sure that didn't mean she turned blue. I'm sure it was an emotional, you know, like depression or some kind of period of time where she was, she locked herself away. And so it seems like he took that like factoid and he just mm-hmm. was like, oh, I have something to work with here. Why not? You know, I can just see him conjuring this, this moment and making it possible. So nothing that he writes about seems fantabulous. In other words, it's doesn't, it doesn't, all of his fiction makes sense. It all <laughs> works, it all works in yeah. the right direction. And while he may have painted himself into a corner when he was writing it, he somehow got himself out of that corner by yes. the story was done. So there's no. Absolutely. No mistakes. You know, there's no, somebody was short in one scene, but tall in the other, or had a mustache and all of a sudden had a beard. (laughs) You know, I'm sure that he wrote that way sometimes, but it all got. He did. He (laughs) He did. Yeah. But I think that's part of like starting a story and then leaving it for a month or so and then getting back to it. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. I, I used to say I'm I'm his continuity editor because I would say, <laughs> wait, he had a mustache in this chapter, but now you say he has a beard. You know, well, that kind of interesting thing. about the phantasmal brigantine is that it sort of insinuates in a magnificent way that Lizzie's the basis of Conan Doyle's creation of Sherlock Holmes. And I thought, I it. I love it. I love it. It's like he <laughs> created this entire universe and then recreated reality in a way that works in my mind. You know what I mean? If, it, yes, if he, this had happened, then yes, that is true. You know? Yeah. I think each of his stories um, worked on a theme and he would say, this is my Sherlock Holmes story. You know, he brings Arthur Conan Doyle in, but he was like, we said earlier, he was very interested in using real characters like Sherlock Holmes doesn't show up in his story. Arthur Conan Doyle shows up. Right. 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 But it's a young Arthur Conan Doyle. I mean, Lizzie Borden and Arthur Conan Doyle lived at exactly the same time. They were only born a year apart. Conan Doyle was one year older than Lizzie. So in this story, uh, I believe he's 19 years old, is it? Conan Doyle comes and Lizzie's 18. Mm -hmm. So um, they're both very young. He has not written Sherlock Holmes yet. But yeah, he's like, oh, consulting detective. (laughs) He kind of gets that idea. Do you Um, know how it would, how it's been received in the Sherlockian community of which you belong? Have they, have they been exposed to this story yet? Or is it because it's so fresh that just got published? Yeah. The book is too fresh. It just was published. So hopefully I'll be getting some feedback about it. I can't it. wait. Um, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh-huh. They'll be like, oh, blasphemy. Or, <laughs> or they'll say, well, that's a good way to bring two stories together in a in a very pleasing way. I just, why not? And also he sprinkles all, all of these homages to, to the Sherlock Holmes stories throughout throughout his story. So that's the thing. He knows uh, everything about Sherlock Holmes and then he knows everything about <laughs> Lizzie Borden and he just sort of weaves them together in ways that, that if you're interested in Lizzie Borden, you get it. If you're interested in Sherlock Holmes or I'm sorry, Conan Doyle, you get it. It's like in jokes almost. And yes, exactly. Fits. They all fit. Yeah. Did exactly. he ever write so, a story for you? Oh, for me? Well, <laughs> it's, 
It is funny. He did. Um, when we were just before we were getting married, he he wrote a story called um, The Agitated Elocutionist because he said, well, I'm marrying a speech pathologist. <laughs> and he would ask me a lot of questions about different types of speech disorders and particularly stuttering he was interested in and the way that people stutter and what it might sound like and what might be some solutions to help them. So he, he took that and ran with it. And he really um, made this very clever, clever mystery out of it where he, the main character is this really pompous <laughs> um, <laughs> elocutionist. And she not only is trying to treat some, some of her clients, but she actually is a little bit um, abusive toward them and, and even making their speech issues worse at times, but um, <laughs> it actually is, is, is pretty amusing. <laughs> well, anyway, nice story. I do love yeah. Story. And he said, well, this is for you because, because I'm marrying a speech pathologist. <laughs> I've had poetry written for me, but I've never had anybody write a whole short story for me. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big tribute. That's a big, yeah. Well, he wrote poetry for me too, of course. Yeah, but well, I mean, was, come on, yeah. a whole story. <laughs> That's that's the stuff of like I don't know legend I don't know I just think that's really <laughs> well he, he certainly was was very sweet. When did he cut, get involved with uh, Sherlock Holmes? Was it you first, him first, both together? How'd that happen? Well, Richard was interested in so many different things. A lot of it was from his childhood. He was very influenced by his father. He was interested in Sherlock Holmes since he was a kid. I mean, I still have the comic book that he bought probably when he was like, I don't know, 11 years old or so. Uh, it was uh, the first and it ended up being only issue of Sherlock Holmes comics. Oh, and wow. I still have it. So, I mean, he was interested in Sherlock Holmes from early on. And he got me interested because I didn't, you know, I, I once had a, a teacher in high school say to the whole class, that Conan Doyle wasn't literary enough for us to do or or our papers on and things because there was a classmate who wanted to to do his paper on on a Sherlock Holmes story and and uh, so then I thought well oh, okay Sherlock Holmes and, and Conan Doyle is not literary so I shouldn't read that so I never did until Richard exposed me to to Sherlock Holmes and then and then I just absolutely loved it, you know, loved the stories and um, I love the time period and he got me involved. And then when Richard and I moved to New England, we started our own Sherlock Holmes group. And that's sort of what got me started. So he he infected you <laughs> <laughs> with the plague of Conan Doyle. <laughs> happily so. Happily, happily so. so. <laughs> yes. And so, now you're uh, now you're a published author in Conan Doyle studies. So that's cool. That's true. I've, I've um, taken it and run with it for a bit. But um, applying your speech pathology to it as well, right? Yes, I did write one essay that um, had to do with um, Conan Doyle using characters who list. <laughs> so. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. <laughs> The, just the idea of it and linking that together. That's, that's, they had nobody had ever looked at that before, I'm sure, right? Before you? Not that I'm aware. I couldn't find any, anything on it um, prior to. In order to get a copy of the Phantasmal Brigantine, they have to get a copy of your latest book, which is what we called before the Monadnock Sherlockian Anthology. Is that right? <laughs> That's exactly right. I said right. It right. Okay. <laughs> That's right. So yes, I printed it under um, Nine Muses Books, and that's uh, where you know all of Richard's work has been published. I included Richard's story in this. It has a variety of things. It has fiction, Richard's story. It has some plays, play pastiches of um, Sherlock Holmes stories. It has some poetry. It has some essays. So it has a little bit of everything in it. And it's the writings from my group. Um, some of my things also has uh, Richard's stepmother, who's a member of my group. She she wrote uh, the play adaptations. Richard's sister, Susan, who 
is also a ling- linguist and a Beatles fan, wrote uh, <laughs> something about John Lennon's Sherlock yeah. Holmes pastiche. So it has quite a variety of things. I'm happy to say that it also includes Richard's story about the Mary Celeste. Unfinished. And, Arthur, and unfinished. Unfortunately, he he passed away before the story was finished. But I think that there's enough of a story there. And he leaves it kind too. of like a cliffhanger <laughs> at the end. Yeah, really. Um, and I think that it it works really well. And I think that people will enjoy it and maybe hopefully come up with their own solution of how they think. Yeah, the we should start some kind of a, I don't know, a page or a thread or something somewhere that says, how do you envision this ending, you know, and have people go talk about it. Yeah. Like, well, on. in the, yeah, at the end of the story, I do, I do say, please, you know, if you have any ideas and I give an email address and have them, <laughs> they can send, send any ideas they might have. I well, would really I enjoy think to read them. Stephen King's like wrote a book that way. Didn't he, didn't he like offer a chapter and then, ask somebody to write the next chapter (laughs) okay they like back and forth like that as it evolved I don't know how they don't paint themselves into corners that way but okay (laughs) well (laughs) you know I didn't really have much of a choice because unfortunately Richard wasn't able to finish the story but Richard wrote in such a unique way in particular in for the Lizzie Borden stories he wrote and he tried to use the language of the time Right. And his vocabulary was quite large. So he used some very unusual words. He used words they would have used back then, but have sort of fallen out of favor now. So we mm-hmm. don't recognize them. So he really put a lot of research in. And I guess what I'm trying to say, it'd be difficult for someone to pick up his story and continue to write it. Well, they would have to, to know everything it. about Lizzie. They'd have to know yeah. everything about Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And they would have to know everything about the period i mean and the mary celeste wait that's four subjects (laughs) that's right (laughs) and and uh, be and have a sense of humor (laughs) and have a a great sense of humor because that's certainly richard had an amazing sense of humor he made me laugh every day Um, i bet i bet and yeah and i think that humor really comes through in uh in his girl detective fiction which the girl detective stuff, the girl detective uh, books are available on Amazon. They're also, they're all on Amazon, aren't they? They're all on Amazon. Yeah. So and, you um, have collections of short stories and mm-hmm. then you have some Kindles, right? And yes. then you have, so the first book was Lizzie Borden, girl detective. That was the first one. And it's a That's collection right. of short stories. And then there's Audible Amnesiac. Yes, the Audible Amnesiac the book mm-hmm. I worked on with you. Why? Did That's it right. That's and great. that has um, all of the short stories collected. In and one then place. the Minuscule Monk. And the Minuscule Monk is the novel length Lizzie Board Girl Detective Mystery. It it's interesting. He wrote it very much like some of the Conan Doyle novels, where Conan Doyle would write a Sherlock Holmes story that was maybe half a novel or, you know, a shorter a version. Yeah. And then he would write the backstory that didn't have Sherlock Holmes in it. And that would be the rest of the novel. The Minuscule Monk is, is written in that way where there's an entire backstory that doesn't have Lizzie or her family in it. Instead of writing it sort of half and half like Conan Doyle did, Richard interspersed the chapters. Like it would be a chapter about Lizzie, and then it would be, say, a backstory chapter. It's a very clever book. It's one of my favorites. I think it remains probably my favorite story of all of them. It's got a huge following. I know that. I know his books are very widely regarded, and Mm -hmm. I don't know why they're not Hello, Hollywood, made into film or a TV (laughs) series. I, I think that they're charming, and the period quality of them is so great. The only thing is if they do take them and make them into something, they can't change the language. They can't make them modern. They can't modernize Lizzie in some lingo fashion. She must sound like she does in these books because it's a particular voice that she has. I think that. Yes. And um, yeah, I, I often thought that, you know, Richard wrote so vividly. He describes the characters, their clothing, the setting. I mean, it's so visual. I mean, he was a filmmaker himself. 
So he really worked hard to describe everything really well. So I think they really would lend themselves to being on the screen. Plus they're hilarious. They are. They are. <laughs> you know, really a are. lot of his characters are just, you know, just so quirky and so funny. And um well, they work yeah, in the a... YA group, you know, the young adult crowd, mm-hmm. as well, because they've got that Nancy Drew quality to them. We're, you know, p- figuring out the mystery. And then they also have this more adult um, plot development. But I don't think it would confuse anyone who was younger. So it's it really runs the gamut as far as age range. I think so. I think they're generally- And young adults are much more sophisticated than people give them credit for. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I I think that it spans uh, age groups. It's appropriate for for a young adult, but certainly, yeah. And and I think that it's it, they would be wonderful and portrayed in you know a miniseries or a film or something. Have you thought of anybody you, famous you'd like to see as this main oh. character? Um, no, <laughs> no, I can't either. I can't imagine it would have to be an unknown. You know, it would have to be somebody who nobody's ever seen before because the story is so fresh. Yeah, you know, but. Yeah. Yeah, and who doesn't come to it with some kind of weird baggage of making these other films or these other kind of movies? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly the girl detective is, you know, she's the smartest person in the room. So it would have to be somebody who can pull that (laughs) off, you know. (laughs) And then, you know, she's always at odds with her sister Emma, who's always trying to best Lizzie. But of course, Lizzie is too smart for that, you know. So there's a lot with the help of Homer now, with the help of Homer. She could she couldn't be herself. She he seems to come and save the day quite a bit in terms of his inventions, not in terms of saving her. Right. But his yeah. inventions and, are quite important into the story. And they're also hilariously interesting and intricate. Right. And I, I think it's interesting also how he Richard wrote um Abby, the stepmother, because in the stories, Abby is not, you know, the wicked stepmother. No. She's not no. no. Um, she's trying to be respectful, but Lizzie clearly does not like her. No, she dismisses <laughs> her all the time. Yeah. So much like Sherlock Holmes, of course, who had his own foibles, um, Lizzie, he writes Lizzie, who has her own, not only, like you said, that she has these episodes of, I don't know, madness, no, whatever you want to call yeah. it, but but she takes her fancy, he called it, where... You know, I guess there was some stories that said she might have uh, stolen some things. I mean, yeah, you know, kleptomania, so, yeah, kleptomania, right? Where she she steals things basically, yeah. but she's she kind of doesn't. She says, "Well, you know, they all know my father, and he'll just they'll just bill him for it." You right. know, like which is no how, harm that's done. how it really worked. Yeah, that's how yeah. it really worked back then. Like yeah. no harm done, right? You know. No, they still um, get their money, and I can pretend, yeah. you know, because. So I, I like that she's she's he really creates her like a real three dimensional character. I she's thought. not, you know, she's certainly very bright, but she also, you know, has these these shortcomings that make well, her. Uh, that's unique. what makes her so so interesting and real. It's when I watch fictional detectives, uh, especially on British, you know, BBC stuff. The most interesting detectives are the ones who have character flaws. Mm-hmm. cuz if they don't if they don't have any character flaws i'm not interested in them because then they're just in love with themselves and who it's just it's uh, egotism as opposed to a character that's got broken in some way and the broken part reveals itself every once in a while you know but it matters that they're human like all of us we're all broken somehow and, oh. and so is lizzie you know she's yeah. broken somehow Exactly. And I, I think I think that's really important. Like I, I think about it in terms of Sherlock Holmes now. If Conan Doyle didn't make Sherlock Holmes, you know, um antisocial and a and a bit of a drug addict, <laughs> right. he he would be no one would want to read the stories because he would be the superhuman person, like a right. superhero. Right. Although he but now with Marvel being like all over the place, who knows? He would be <laughs> some kind of, you know, super detective. <laughs> Superhero right. detective. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I do think though it works better to make to make your your hero 
a human and not a superhero. So. Exactly. Because then you can have things like the 7% solution and then you just go, oh, what's that mean? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And have all these other movies that kind of talk about him or are about him, but aren't his stories, mm -hmm. but use him in ways that it, are interesting because he does have these issues, issues that are indicative of the times he lived in also. Same yeah. as, you know, but Richard was also like super involved in some esoteric things, uh, shamanism, uh, yeah. occultism, but not just the belief system. I don't mean to say that he was um, a member of a group of people who practiced. I mean that he was, I think, involved in the philosophy behind it. And he surprisingly wrote a great deal on these subjects, didn't he? He did. In fact, there's a book that's a collection of all his essays of moons and monoliths. And he he wrote on so many different topics. He had particular writers that he really um, loved, Philip K. Dick being one, Thomas Pynchon, J.G. Ballard, William Burroughs. And, you know, he loved James Joyce, too. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever known anyone else who read Finnegan's Wake. Nope, <laughs> not I. I. Nope. Um, not even when they were so, forced to. They found a way. <laughs> that's <them>. right. <laughs> so... Um, yes, Richard um, was very much into mysticism. He, he really was since I think he was a teenager. And he really, he took it very seriously. He, he kind of like mapped mystical things on like all aspects of his life. So it was really important to him. And it does show through his writings, not only in the Moons and Monoliths, but he you know, he did add little mystical elm elements in some of his other stories as well. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so it was really important to him. And I just think he was an extraordinary thinker and he could synthesize all this information and, and it sort of made sense to him and, and not so much to the rest of us, but I think to him it all, it all um, made sense and it helped him in his creativity. I think one, there's a story that I was going to ask you about later, but I want to ask it about it now, which is um, at his memorial his best friend, one of his best friends told this story that blew me away, which ties into this Richard brain connecting things all around us into this sort of mystical understanding of the way the universe works or what we don't know about how the universe works. And it was the story of the frog. And it stayed with me and it stayed with me and it stayed with me. And I think it's worth retelling. Would you mind? Oh, not at all. Well, as best as I can remember it, um, because it wasn't told to me, but that was the first time I heard it too. Is that? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was with his friend at, we, we have a, a college here right in town, Keene State, and they were on the grounds of Keene State and outside of the library, there's this sort of behind it, this like kind of marshy area where there's lots of frogs and they could hear the frogs. And, and so Richard said, well, you know, this, the frogs in this marsh are just one wall away from this, the library, which is the vast knowledge of all of humankind in there, but they're completely unaware of it, even though they're right up against it. So he said, well, we as humans could have something like that right in front of us, but we just lack the ability to perceive it or understand it or even know it's there so that that's my recollection of <laughs> what that story was but yeah I mean and I think that he sort of lived his life that way as part I guess that's part of mysticism okay so but like person. you and me we we go into a library and we hear a frog and we look down we see the frog you go oh look a frog and then we walk into the library he becomes this he becomes this thinking he is always thinking he is always making the connection the philosophical and he was a philosopher he really was a philosophy of how how much we don't know is like indicative of what this frog doesn't know you know and and i just this universe i keep calling it a universe but it's it's not a mass, like a physical mask. It's a a mental 
understanding or non-understanding of the way things are connected and interconnected. I mean, there's whole philosophies of the way things work. And he just seemed to see the profound in the obvious, you know, or in the mundane. Yes. Like I say, I, I, the only word I can think of that consistently describes him is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody would say that. I don't think anybody ever yeah. said a bad thing about him. I don't think anybody had an unkind word to say about him or he was kind to everybody. Um, mm-hmm. And he respected everybody's when he did the podcast, this podcast, he asked questions because he wanted to know the answer from the person he was asking the question of. It wasn't that he already knew the answer. Mm-hmm. It was that he was willing to be taught something always. Oh, always. So he was always yeah. a student. Yes. And I think that, that that is refreshing in a human being where they, they give you your their undivided attention because they really care what you have to say. He was like that. Oh, he, he was like that with everyone, regardless of their background or educational level, or he he was as interested in what they had to say, no matter, you know, he he could adjust and just think about, oh, they you know, they'll, they dig a hole for a living, a ditch for a living. And he would want to know about that. And and he'd be sincere. I only met one other person like that. And he was also, is also extremely well-liked because of that, because it's such a, an unusual person to get to know and to have in your life. Somebody that cares about what you say and what you think and, and Mm -hmm. listen, really really listens. He was a listener. He was. They're rare. We yeah. could turn it on and off, but he kept it on. He kept it on. Right. He he was. And yeah, he just he surprised me every day. Like I say we would watch a, a movie or a I don't know, play together. And then, you know, I just think, oh, that was nice. <laughs> and the next day he would he would tell me about all the connections and all the you know references and and I'd think, okay, oh. he obviously saw a lot more than I did. <laughs> And right. most other people. <laughs> so I see um, this projection behind his head with things <laughs> happening while you're watching the movie. And he's like making lines and making graphs right. and equations and stuff while he's just sitting there watching a movie. Well, I, once in England, we went to see a Shakespeare ballet and the ballet was what was really like modern dance. And there was all these different like vignettes and and um, and you know, it was, it was actually enjoyable to watch, but I, I didn't really understand how it all related to to Shakespeare. But when we were talking about it afterward, Richard said, oh, well, you know what I think it was? I think it was, it was based on the sonnets and the, the different stanzas of, of the sonnets and the form. And that's how he goes because they started out with this many dancers, and then and he explained it and he oh mapped it right on to the sonnets. And we had a, a Shakespeare scholar with us, and he even blew her away because she said, "I had no idea." Like she goes, "You're absolutely right." Now that I think about it, but um, he sees things no one else sees. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he really did have extraordinary mind. Yeah, yeah. and then he was a filmmaker. I mean, I first met him when he made the documentary or right after he made the documentary Almost Gone, which was about, if I'm not mistaken, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, right? Is that where it was taking place? And it was. Oh, yes. Bethlehem Mm Steel. And it closed down and he did this documentary about the remains of the steel industry in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I, for some reason, we got in touch with one another. I was living in Florida. He was living in, I think, Pennsylvania. And he wanted me to see it or something. And he sent me a disc of it. And I watched, well, I watched it. And it was a DVD. And it was like, I was blown away by this small film about, about this. It, it meant something to me. And I saw what he saw. Let's put it that way. So with his camera, he could show you things in the same way that he did literal, literarily, <laughs> sorry, hard word to say, literarily, when he would describe something. It was very filmic, like he had the filmmaker's eye. And he, yes, he did. And um, some of that, well, I think it was f- photographed by his friend, Mark Reed. Yeah. And he took Mark's 
photos and he he made them like into a film like he would scan them much like I guess um Burns does you know kind of makes it into a film and and then he imposed the music and narration and yeah it, it's very moving and mo- very moving film to show like the former workers there and now it's in ru- you know ruins and very extraordinary and then later he's making these little Lizzie mini films which are still on the YouTube channel for right. uh the Lizzie Borden channel and these Lizzie minis uh, I think are super important only for the snapshot in time that we're talking about with people who are recorded by him at the board in bed and breakfast, right? As well, maybe one is at a graveyard, but he he talks to people who are involved in studying Lizzie Borden or right. big time scholar people like Len Rabello mm-hmm. and and records them. And creates these little teeny movies that are interesting and informative and right. wish he had continued them. Well, some aspect of the case, right? And they would talk, they would have some particular expertise. So he'd film them um, talking about the subject they wanted to talk about. Um, or sometimes I think he did that, the Bridget run. Uh, was it the Bridget Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like how long would it take have taken her to run down the street? And yeah, the, you know. Things like that. Um, he even did a little film of of, of the cat, Max the cat, <laughs> 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 there, the resident of the B and B. But he spent time at that house, so he you yeah. know got to know the building and got to know the people. And yes, he enjoyed making those films. I just think he got to the point where he was doing so many different things. He didn't have enough time to do them all. I know he wanted to make more films and certainly had ideas for them, but he also had ideas for more stories and more essays and, and more podcasts. So, and then unfortunately, you know, he became ill and he could, could not manage much um, day to day. So he could maybe do a few hours of something. Dude, and he was- got out how many podcasts? Let's see. He did 11. 11 podcasts and they have a following and we're doing one now. Hopefully that will have that same following because, <laughs> because it was about him and it was about him talking about Lizzie you know, he did the primers and he did, you know, with Sarah Miller. Right. Um, yes. And he talked to me about fires in fall river and he talked to Joey Razda about playing uncle John every August 4th at the reenactment at the house Mm -hmm. and they have thousands and thousands of views. So he's reaching people from the beginning, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's a good thing that we continue with the podcast and his tradition. Right. And yeah. And he's gotten, you know, he, he was interviewed by, you know, the guardian and Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone magazine. And I was uh, interviewed in the New York Times on, you know, because of his work, you know, so it, it, um, he uh, has amassed quite a following. So, well, it's been an honor. I'm honored to be given the opportunity to continue his legacy as the new host of the Lizzie Borden podcast. And I, I try each episode to be like Richard. And I really do <laughs> uh, because it was the way he spoke to people with great respect and interest and learning from the answers and making connections back to Lizzie Borden or some other aspect of history. I try to do that too. And I want to thank you personally for this opportunity because to me, each podcast is a tribute to Richard as they should be. He invented this and it is the only one that's only devoted to Lizzie Borden. And I think that in a really intelligent way. And, you know, it's not about the slash, the gore, the blood, the crime, but about history and mystery and everything that goes around the story at the same time. And I think because of that, he's got uh, a following of all kinds of, you know, people who are interested in many different things are interested in this one because it's not about the crime. Right. It's it's different, I think, than true crime podcasts in general, because, um, yeah, he wa- he wanted it to be historically accurate information and not sensationalist. Right. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. It's not sensationalism. That's exactly yeah. right. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because when I was thinking of doing my website, you know, I was thinking I looked around and everything out there that was connected to Lizzie Borden was blood and gore. I was like, I don't like any of that. I don't I don't need Halloween all every day. You know, I'm not into that. I'm not into I'm not into the sensationalism of the story. It's sensational enough all by itself. It's like the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast. When I stayed there the first time in 1997, it opened in 1996. 19, yes, 1996. And I was there the very next summer, August, July 12th. I remember because it was my sister's birthday. And I was scared sleeping there. But I wasn't scared because I was afraid it was haunted. I was scared because I was sleeping in a house where two murders had happened. <laughs> and that I had never done that before. That enough. That's enough for me. That's enough sensationalism, you know, without adding spooky stuff, you know, added to it. The house itself is a wonder that it still exists. And I'm glad that Richard got to visit it and be a part of its history and uh, film it in ways that are no more. Because with each successive owner, there'll be changes, you know, there'll be adjustments, there'll be new business models, there'll be new choices made, new furnishings, <laughs> new bedspreads. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be different uh, as it goes through time, but at least it's still standing. And 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 I think Richard has created this Au revoir. How do you say that? Au revoir. Au revoir. This oeuvre. This oeuvre of the Lizzie Borden um, stories and delightful, inventive creations that will live well beyond him and hopefully can entertain for generations to come because they're worth it. They're they're timeless. All of it yeah. is timeless. It's just yeah, it's it's really important to me that they they stay in print and they keep them available because I think they really are wonderful stories, um, as are his essays too. And um, so yeah, so thank you for that for helping me with that and for um, continuing with the podcast. I I um we I took a hiatus for a while because I thought well no one no one else can be the host like Richard could, but um, you're doing a great job and I thank you. Well, I love him. I loved him so, so I want him to be honored in any way I can. It's the least I can do. And anyway, you're welcome. So my last question (laughs) is uh, what's next for Nine Muses books and the Lizzie Borden podcast? And most importantly, what's next for you? Oh, well, well, like I just said, I want to keep, you know, his, this legacy alive and keep his books available and, and um, continuing to look through his, his unpublished writings and say what else there is for. Oh, you still keep next. popping up and finding things. Oh, I do. I do. Uh, <laughs> and um, so uh, I'm continuously doing that. Um, and certainly the podcast will continue and um, we have lots of great episodes lined up. We do. And, um, we do. Stay tuned. Yeah. So, <laughs> so and um, I'm really you know, excited about the next two of them. Yes. 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 We have some good, really good stuff coming. So, um, and you know, I'm my day job is I'm a speech pathologist, so I continue with that as well. So, and school starts yeah. soon. So, we'll start soon. My yeah. condolences. <laughs> <laughs> your summer. That's all. Oh, Just to your summer. Not <laughs> having a job is not a wonderful thing. And what you do is so important. I'm just mean too bad. Summer's gone. And <laughs> but um thank you for this opportunity. And it was great, you know, talking about Richard and uh I think we're gonna release I... this on August 29th, right? 27th is his oh yes that's his what it birthday August so let's 27th release this on August 27th as a as a birthday present to I think that'd be lovely yes, okay thank let's you do that. Well, he thank you so it. much Stephanie. no thank you Anna yeah. it's it's I know it's been it's been um hard to lose him and and I know yeah. how much you loved him and 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 it's not the same love that everybody else had for him so it's far deeper but those that knew him loved him too and it's important that we can all share in this richard appreciation because it's all about richard mm. 
anyway, thanks very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 18. We've been talking to Anna Behrens about the late, great Richard Behrens. Her latest book, Monadnock Sherlockian Anthology, is now available on Amazon.com. Find Richard Behrens, Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube. If you like what you're hearing, please consider supporting this podcast by subscribing to it on patreon.com.